Hi, everyone. Welcome to the last session of the year of the Disability Innovation Live webinar series. Today's session is about race, disability, and innovation. And we have an amazing uh, set of panelists presenting today. I will just share my screen so you can see the presentation that we have prepared. Thank you, everyone, for joining. So our today's session is about race, disability, and innovation, diversity, and the disability innovation movement. We have um, available closed captions and British Sign Language interpretation. To turn on the closed captions, they, they should be turned on, but let us know if they're not working. Um, you can do this by gallery view next to the green bar at the top of the screen and then click view options menu and select view side by side. This is only available desktop only. So if you're connecting from a mobile device and um, we suggest that you change to a desktop if, if possible. Um, we will have a questions and, and a, a Q and A session. And this um, session will be recorded. We will upload it to YouTube and we will have a transcript available. So about this, this series of events that we do, the Disability Innovation Live series is about sharing knowledge and experiences in disability innovation. We want to know the stories behind the innovations, the people behind the products, and it's an informal space for ideas and reflections. And all feedback is welcome, as always. About the Global Disability Innovation Hub, we're a research and practice center driving disability innovation for a fairer world. We were born out of the legacy of the 2012 Paralympic uh, Games. And we're a community interest company and academic research center based at UCL. We currently have programs in 25 countries and we are working to reach 15 million people by 2020, 2022. So our set of, of panelists today, we have Iola Olafinan, who is a board member of the GDI Hub. We have Kush Kanodia, also a board member and disability champion. We have Paul Entulila, assistant project manager and GDI Hub staff member. And we have Crystal Emery joining from the US. Uh, it's, more, it's the morning for her. And it's she's the CEO and founder of URU Uro, the Right to Be Inc. So an amazing set of panelists, and we're really excited about this, this topic, which we think it's very timely to discuss. And just an introduction of, of what we'll be discussing this session is the intersectionality between race and disability. And we see the intersectionality of, of being the interplay of different social identities, so how uh, the identity related to disability and the identity related to race can uh, interconnect um, to either uh, create more barriers and how these uh, identities define those barriers and, and how can we all overcome these barriers. From, so from employment to entrepreneurship, education to aspirations, we will be asking what's next to make the disability innovation space more inclusive and exploring why diversity is critical to innovation. And, and this exploration of, of race and disability is uh, relatively new for the GI Hub. So we're uh, really looking forward to what the panelists will, will be sharing with us, but also of the audience and, and your views and questions. So we will start now with Kush Kanodia. So Kush, if you could um, turn on your camera and audio. Hi, um, th thank you, Rosa. Um, thank you for the GDI Hub for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, so I have a lived experience of being a BAME um, disabled person, and I was actually a torchbearer for the Paralympics. And I think that really shows a good example of how empowering disabled people can lead um, to innovation. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, the no wheelchair tax campaign that I created that was basically a campaign to abolish all disabled car parking charges in all NHS hospitals. 
in England. So the first bullet point, um, it's, I'll, I'll read out the slide as well, that we were published in the Times, the Telegraph, the Daily Mail, Disability News Service twice, and we interviewed um, with BBC London Radio. And we actually managed to get um, the campaign into the manifestos um, in the 2019 um, election, UK elections, for both um, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. Um, so that was like a real great achievement. And then we actually also got agreement from the Liberal Democrats as well, because um, we were working with MPs from all the main political parties, um, from Marsha Dakova of Labour to Robert Halfen of the Conservatives, um, to Vince Cable of the Liberal Democrats. Um, so that was real kind of transformative systems change. So the second bullet point was that we, we managed to abolish all disabled car parking charges in 206 NHS hospitals in England. And this helps 2.5 million disabled people to access critical health care. Um, in the NHS. And I wanted to thank the Global Disability Innovation Hub and Lord Chris Holmes for their support because they provided key support for the campaign. And basically London went into lockdown yesterday. We know that COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted disabled people. We know that say only say 26% of our tube stations are accessible and there's a higher risk of contracting COVID-19 from public transport. So this innovation, this systems change will actually help to save disabled people's lives and provide access to critical health care. So what the Conservative Party did, they actually expanded upon my campaign, which my campaign was focused on disabled people with blue badges. They expanded it to um, parents of sick children um, people who are long-term inpatients and um, NHS um, night staff. So one of the things that I realized that there was going to be a supply and demand issue when it came to hospitals, when it gets implemented. So originally it was supposed to be implemented in April and now it's gonna be implemented in January in 2001. So what I realized was the only way that I can really match supply and demand was to enable the local street network. So the third point, the new campaign in a way is to create a standardized and compassionate disabled parking policy for London, where the proposal basically is for the inner London boroughs to provide four hours of free parking in pay and display areas for blue badge holders. So that would be, um, for the inner London boroughs of the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, the city of Westminster, the city of London and parts of Camden. And then for the outer London boroughs, the remaining 29 boroughs to provide free disabled parking. So that would create systems change in London. And the four hours is actually the same statutory target for waiting times for A&E. So this was, would provide access to critical goods and services for disabled people in the time of a pandemic and lockdown. So I believe this is really kind of critical um, change. And we've already actually managed to get the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea um, to create systems change. So they actually did a six week public consultation in the beginning of the summer where they received no objections and they implemented the change in September what they did was they created hospital wards. So they created three hospital wards around um, Chelsea Westminster, the Royal Brompton, which is our speciality cardiology unit, the Royal Marsden, which is our speciality cancer unit, and St. Charles Hospital. Um, and so now I'm basically trying to campaign, create a campaign for systems change across the whole of London. So I've been fortunate to have additional supporters from the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea recently, the Sean Bailey, who's the Conservative Mayor candidate um, for London, um, Nikki Aitken, who's the MP um, for the Conservative MP for City of London and Westminster, and lots of disabled people's organisations from Action for Disability, Kensington and Chelsea, Westminster, the City of London Access Group, Inclusion London, Disability Rights UK, and now we're in discussions with the Lib Dem candidate and the Green Party candidate. 
So basically what my call is um, now, as I'm calling on all London councils and political parties to immediately support the campaign in their election manifestos for the London mayor elections in May um, 2021. So we can make London the most accessible city in the world. And then we can replicate the same systems change in all councils in England, in the UK. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kush. Thank you for that presentation. And, and what I really um, liked about um, what you mentioned is just the, the importance of, of campaigning and connecting the, the campaigning with uh, policy changes and how a campaign that started with a specific scope then grew to um, cover more people. So um, it, it clearly goes with, with accessibility being best for everyone um and the other the other point that i thought was was quite interesting is that you mentioned um trying to position london as the most accessible city in the world and that's something that goes very well with the paralympic legacy and with the torch that we, you were carrying a few years ago um and thank you for that presentation we will also pick up on on what you mentioned of, of their relation with covid 19 um, in the in the questions, um, but right now we will go with the second speaker, and the second speaker is my colleague Colin Tulila. He's the assistant project manager at the GI Hub, and he will be covering uh, different topics around the work that he has been doing in the past few months. So up, over to you, Paul. If you could turn on your camera and your audio. Uh, interpreter, you're muted. Ah, my apologies. Hello, can everybody hear me? Hi, everybody. Thanks for thank you, Rosa, for passing over to me. I'll begin my presentation now. Um, thank you. So this is if we just want to go onto my slides. Ah, perfect. Bear with me. Can we see Paul? Is Paul's camera on? Sorry, can everybody see Paul? Yes, we can see yeah. Paul. Yeah. If you're going to ask Paul to unmute, it will just make sure the audience can see him too. Okay, yep, fine. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Hi, everybody. Hello, thank you for coming and joining us to the presentation today. So uh, recently, uh, this is something I've been working on. I've been working on um, a project with G GDI Hub um, since um, National Inclusion Week on, in September, 2020. And we were looking at black uh, disabled innovation and uh, exploring why um, that's so important and how we can get diversity into that. Um, and so we were exploring uh, questions around that and I was interviewing people and talking to people whose backgrounds um, were working in this area, whose shared life experiences were, were in this area as well. And um, we were looking at the um, challenges and um, and things that they'd experienced through their life because of this and how that had affected um, innovation and discrimination that they'd felt. So also we were looking about how they'd influenced others um, and how this, this information could be used. So especially like black innovators and how this could be used as an example for the community um, in the UK um, and globally. Um, so uh, our GDI hub, of course, focuses on um, yeah, the other one. Yeah, looking at how it could work through YouTube and globally. And so um, 
we want accessible presence there too. Sorry, bear with me. Can we go on to the next slide? Okay, so this is connected to good leadership and making a difference um, to uh, diverse innovation. So um, there was a vlog that went viral. Um, this was a little bit ago and it was about the effect of, on people, on um, Yeah, it was it was on how um, Black Lives Matter happened and the effect that this had on um, on people um, that are intersectional and how um, and how leadership can make a difference on that. So I just wanted to share that with you at the moment that can have a massive effect, uh, especially in employment um, and in the workplace, uh, because there's a double discrimination there. And it's about feeling safe and also having somewhere to express that feeling, being comfortable enough to talk about and express um, my experience and what's happening to me and, um, and being able to uh, have a safe space to do that with black colleagues or people that understand the same experience. And I think leadership have a great responsibility in empathizing and working with people and understanding that. And that makes a massive difference in how we move on um, and, and make sure that we're all included and we are working together to remove the barriers for a more inclusive future. Can we move on to the next uh, slide? Now, um, it's very difficult to focus on setting something up because we want to make sure that um, workplaces are inclusive um, but without being tokenistic. So we want to make sure that we're working together to with the black community and with different cultures to have everybody included in that and making sure that uh, we're working towards uh, something really smoothly and collaboratively. Um, the opportunities um, for the black community within innovation really need to be improved because at this point that there, there isn't any equity, there aren't the same opportunities offered so um, moving forward um, for disabled black innovators, we need to be creating those opportunities and removing those barriers and encouraging people to improve, um, improve how they are visibly making differences. It's really important that there are scholarships and uh, training opportunities provided so that uh, this disadvantage um, is removed and there's just this leveling up the playing field. We need to, um, we need to grow the skills in within that uh, community, um, so we can we can be more visible and show people that um, you can get through and the barriers there can be removed. Next slide, please. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And, and Paul and I, we've been working together in this topic. And, and I remember when you first proposed the, the blog that you mentioned, uh, we, we were discussing how, how to best convey the, the messages that, that relate to um, disability race, but also about leadership, which is a, a great connection as well. And, and the, the format of, of the blog was the first that we did at the DI Hub of, of having, instead of a written blog, a video blog. And that, that was quite powerful. Um, and it was in your, in, in BSL, so quite, quite touching and moving. So um, just wanted to, to highlight that. And something else that you mentioned that I thought was quite interesting is the need for, for scholarships. And the GDI Hub has been running the Snowden Trust scholarships, which help um, disa disable um, leaders get into um, higher education in the UK but also the, the need for skills development to um, level up the, the playing field. So quite, quite important. And, and we can follow up that on, on the question session. So thank you for your uh, presentation, Paul. And we will now have Crystal. She's joining from the US. It's really early in the US at the moment. And I'll just ask um, Luis to play the video that Crystal wants to show us before her chat.
you can stop sharing your screen, Rosa. Good Thank morning. you, Louise. Crystal, over to you. Thank you. Okay. I'm Crystal Day Emery, and I'm a filmmaker and producer and the founder and CEO of You Are You The Right To Be. Uh, it's a nonprofit content production company that deals with social justice issues, and we utilize solutions that meet at the intersection of the arts humanities, and science. Uh, in addition to my work at URU, I am a member of the Producers Guild of America and the New York Women in Film and Television, and I was selected as a AAAS, if then ambassador for girls and staff. Every day I triumph over two chronic... Get him short. Every day I triumph over two chronic diseases... Uh, as a quadriplegic to create real and sustainable change. My physical identity mm. lays at the intersection of race, gender, and disability. Get involved. Uh, my projects and initiatives change the narrative about marginalized, get under, underserved, underestimated communities and challenge to all a disabled and able body to engage in open and honest dialogue and leverage the power of our collective impact. Um, I tell stories not only to arouse empathy, but to empower us all, and I mean all, to seize a future in which we are realizing our full potential. So there should be a slide. So this slide is that the 2020 emerging research uh, in Washington, and all of these folks have some form of a disability. You are using approach to sustainable change making is multifaceted, utilizing film print, virtual reality, and face-to-face -face engagement. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to three projects in particular that speak to our intersectionality and our approach to change making. Uh, in 2015, I launched the project Changing the Face of STEM, an initiative designed to empower all students, uh, and not, not just young people, uh, to pursue careers in STEM fields, regardless of what the world deems them capable of. I really, really believe that STEM offers the greatest opportunity for people with disabilities to be fully uh, employed. Um, and now with the pandemic, we see that everyone is working from home. And with technology like this, where, you know, we're being broadcast all around the world, uh, it opens the door for us to be fully engaged. Uh, Changing the Face of STEM, my project, acknowledges the limited learning opportunities available for students with disabilities, but we can do something about that. And it starts with us, and it starts with what you're doing today, because if you can't see it, you can't be it. So we bring students face-to-face -face with doctors and astronauts and engineers. And that photo that you're looking at, you know, those are some amazing 
PhD candidates, and uh, one of the women who is uh, visually impaired uh, has to go out and work in the blog, bogs. And so how do you go out, you know, in the mud and, and do that kind of work? And getting mentors to help you get through that. This is our other project, Building Bridges, the Power of the Sisterhood. Um, you know, women are healers. And bringing women together, a very diverse group, um, and getting them to work together, um, creating a, a collective impact. For building riches and powers of sisterhood, we take professional women in STEM to engage in open, honest dialogue about the divide that exists between white women and women of color. Uh, women in STEM drive innovation uh, because these fields are not tied welcoming spaces for women or people with disabilities uh, or women of color. All too often, we get into survival mode, approaching our pathways to success as a competition to occupy those limited spaces. What I'm trying to get people to do is to work together. We have more power um, as a collective than we do uh, as trying to address these issues separately. Um, building bridges creates a dedicated space for diverse groups and courageous conversation. And we really, really need to have courageous conversations. Today is a courageous conversation. Um, and so when you talk about, you know, disabilities at work, you know, and what is the perspective of people of color, you know, we are like triple whammy. You know, we get... Um, discriminated against because we're a woman, then we're black, then we have a disability, and time is changing. It is time for us to stand up and demand who we are and what we're capable of. Next slide. My most recent initiative, um, our humanity, excuse me, is a prevention and education transformation. It's designed to address the disparities in COVID-19 messaging and education that exists across the lines of race and disability. <clears throat> the CDC recently declared racism a public health crisis, and we need to no longer... Uh, walk around this, we need to look at the devastating, disproportionate impact of COVID-19 in the community of color, as well as in the community of people with disabilities. Uh, the pandemic has only exponentiated, <coughs> sorry, uh, <coughs> exacerbated disparities in health care, good health care outcomes, uh, that exists for communities of color and people with disabilities. As a person with a disability, we are far more vulnerable to the ravages of this virus. We are left to live in a constant state of uncertainty, uh, highly aware of our vulnerability, yet rendered invisible by local, national, and global response to COVID-19. So I was really glad to see uh, what the gentleman before his work uh, with the bus uh, situation. Uh, we are in the middle of rolling out our humanity, utilizing faith-based collaboratives. So we're working with the Pentecostal a worldwide organization, which has 2.5 million uh, members, as well as the Baptist Convention, which has about 200 chapters around the United States. Um, I could go on about the work that URU is engaged in, but I just want to say that conversations and connections like these here today are ways <laughs> so necessary for all of us to do the best work that change the world. 
Later today, I'm moderating a panel on diversity and inclusion for Google. So I do feel like more and more we are all looking to new types of innovation, good engagement that embraces all people. I'm thrilled to be part of this panel. Good to hear from my fellow panelists as well. So thank you so much for inviting me. And um, I think it goes back to the moderator. Thank you, Crystal. Amazing presentation. Um, and I just want to highlight some some of the things you mentioned. Um, so you said that more power we can get as a collective than to do it separately. And, and we can see that uh, across all the presentations that, that we've seen so far, and I'm sure um, with the presentation that, that we have left from, from Iola as well, and that I thought that was quite powerful. And also the fact that you, you mentioned that this is a courageous conversation, and I agree because uh, there's, there's considerably lack of, of information and debate around the intersectionality of disability and race, but also the intersectionality between disability, race, and gender. So the fact that during your presentation, you also highlighted that I thought that, that was quite interesting, and it just opens a space for, for discussion and debate and and actions and campaigns to look forward to in, in, in the next year or so. And, and really good to hear that you will have a presentation with Google today. Good, good luck with that. And we will now follow up um, the, the panelists and the next presenter is Iola. Thank you, Iola. I can see your camera is on, so you can activate the microphone. It's active now, so I'll over, over to you now. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Iyola Olafimihan. I'm a member of the Global Disability Innovation Hub Board, Advisory Board. My conversation with you today primarily focuses on how assistive technology innovated in back in Nigeria enabled me to gain a lot of independence. So I was born over 50 years ago and I contracted polio at a very early age. So I've never really known how to walk or how it feels for people, to, how it feels to walk. However, at that very early stage, my parents actually supported me to be independent. So what one of the things they did was to enable me to use crutches and calipers and all that at that very early stage to actually go to school myself because we lived quite close to my primary school. And I was able to access education on an equal basis with non-disabled, my non-disabled peers. I, I, well, what will really impact my life was when I finished <coughs> university <coughs> and started working in the bank as a lawyer. <coughs> and I didn't have any, because Nigeria, we don't have really good accessible transportation and all that. And how to actually buy a non-accessible car and employ a driver. If, if you've been to Nigeria before and you know how we are there, if you have a driver that is a rascal, it might mean that sometimes you don't even have your own car to ride. Anyway, the driver eventually smashed my car and I was even for a while carless. But what happened was my big sister introduced me to a gentleman called Cosma Sokoli, who a disabled man himself found a way to innovate a very simple technology to drive an automated car. So I went to see him and I saw, behold, that a disabled wheelchair user or a crutch user can actually drive a car in Nigeria. And the picture I have on, on the screen illustrates that simple mechanism, which later on when I came to the UK, found to be very, very technical here in the UK. But back in Nigeria, that simple technology that my friend Cosmas or colleague innovated in his center actually enabled me to have more access, enabled me to attend press conferences about disability issues and rights in Nigeria, and eventually made me to actually apply to come and study here in the UK, human rights and social justice, and to learn more about how AT is improving people's lives. So my being part of Global Disability Innovation Hub is actually to also emphasize that assistive technology 
is actually a human right that enables people to live their lives as fully as possible. That is my short presentation. Uh, like I said, it's just to focus on how AT has enabled a disabled person like me to have freedom and independence back home in my country, Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you, Iola. Really, really fascinating story. And I think um, what I really enjoyed of, of your presentation is how you connect with your personal trajectory, but of the also on the power of innovation in, in mi middle and uh, low and middle income countries. And that's something that at the GI Hub we're quite focused on. And it's part of our UK funded 8020 program is testing what works in low and middle income countries and how these innovations can be then scaled up. And, and just the fact that, as you mentioned, you said it was just a simple technology and that allowed you to, to drive. It's, it's, it's a showcase of, of how in, in, in many countries that, that we're currently working on and, and in Nigeria being your example, we can find some innovations that can be replicated and can uh, have a, a relevant and, and quite substantial impact in, in people's lives. And I thought that that was quite quite important and, and relevant to highlight, but also um, how you mentioned this this person that created the technology. It was a life changing moment for you, and how that um, sort of uh, opened up opportunities. And and that's um, how we connect AT as well. We see the assistive technologies being products that open up opportunities for for those that don't have it and need it. And, and those who need it the most as well. So I will now go to the Q&A session. So I prepared some questions. And the first question is, uh, what are the biggest challenges in increasing diversity within disability innovation? And Kush, uh, I will perhaps ask you to, to respond to this one. Um, especially in the UK context, uh, what are your views of, of the biggest challenges in, in increasing diver uh, diversity within the disability innovation movement? Um, thanks. Um, so I think one of the biggest challenges I found is the aspect of confidence. Um, so we have like a benefit system in the UK, but the benefit system is very based around an energy of fear. And I find that's very kind of um, difficult and restricting for disabled people to break out of. I think there's a key issue in relation to, to a prevalence of mental health um, for, for BAME and disabled people. And that's basically due to compounding aspects of discrimination, of intersectionality from race and disability. There's social barriers, there's attitudinal barriers, in relation to racism, ableism, stigma, and that's all compounded for BAME disabled people. Um, I find that there's, there's a real lack of, of help and support for disabled people on their paths, um, whether that's to employment or to education or to being an entrepreneur. Um, as, as we've discussed previously, there's lots of barriers to access um, the environments that we're in there's a real lack of a visible role models um, for BAME disabled people. Because the truth is if, if as, a, as a BAME disabled person, if I don't see similar people like myself in leadership positions, then it becomes very difficult for me to dream. It becomes very difficult for me to vision and kind of aspire to, 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 to be a leader. If I don't see that the system is kind of proportionally representational um, to society. And another key value that I find that the system, it doesn't value lived experience leadership. And I think that's really critical and we really need to start valuing lived experience leaders. So in the disability movement, we have a mantra, nothing about us without us. And it would be really good if that mantra was adopted and by the system as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Kush. Really, really interesting. Um, and I and I really enjoyed how you mentioned the importance of visibility and and seeing uh, black and minority ethnic uh, 
leaders that that is fundamental to sort of create the new generation aspiring to to get into positions of not only aspiring but actually having the opportunities to get to positions of, of power and, and relevance and and um also in the policy making sphere and and paul you you worked on on leadership and and the aspect of leadership so perhaps it would be good if you could let us know what you think are the biggest challenges in, in increasing diversity within disability innovation and touching on, on the leadership um, bit as well? Yes, thank you. So uh, just in response to that, uh, the challenge is uh, through increasing diversity, what we need really is um, breaking through the barriers. So that's through, I believe, education and training, maybe technology training um, and developing people that know the um, backgrounds well and they're prepared um, to, to be involved and to really grow and develop the skills. We need to challenge this to uh, within policymakers and making sure that the influencers are there to make sure that um, we're innovating and creating um, policies as well that shows um, how we can be involved, our rights. Um, how do we how do we become governors? How do we become involved in these policy making decisions and influencing um, to integrate and make uh, these these areas these spaces more accessible? through black people and and all different identities that aren't represented that are underrepresented and my experience through um through um leadership is it's really important to have those those conversations because that's how we improve um through creating um uh, an open dialogue with people and um and showing showing that we can talk about this openly and collectively that will remove the barriers it's through that that we can break through thank you paul and i and i really want to highlight from your response the the importance of opening up spaces um, to discuss these issues i think that is something quite relevant and and initially when we thought about this session we thought of of this event being that a uh, uh, space uh, where we could discuss it, but also perhaps um, encourage all other people to, to discuss it as well in their organizations. Um, so now um, I want to perhaps um, ask uh, Crystal if she wants to have a response to this question from the US perspective. Take care. Uh, yes, you know, I think that leadership is, you know, that each of you here is a leader in your own right, and that we have to become more visible, because in order for a the next generation to be able to move forward, they have to see us, but also for the current power structure, they have to see us and understand that we are capable. That's why I made that little clip that says, you know, we are talented, we are creative, you know, we are innovators. I mean, think about, you know, each of us dealing with whatever our disability is. We have to work harder than most people. We have to think outside the box what most people take for granted. Because I always tell people, that also makes us great employees uh, because we don't just settle for mediocrity. We always have to be at our our best. And so I think that we make great employees. I think that, you know, as leaders, we demonstrate our truth. Um, and so it's really important that we as a collective uh, make sure that we are out there uh, where all people could see us so that we become the norm and not the exception. Um, and I just think it's really important uh, that whatever platform we can utilize to demonstrate our capableness, that other leaders will then look to us for answers 
um, and that we are role models for the next generation that they can understand you can be anything you want to. So those are my thoughts. Not a scar. Thank you, Crystal. And really, really inspiring uh, response. And, and something that, that I really liked of what you said is just the fact that you said we are great employees. That's absolutely like that. But you're also great innovators because you, you have the capacity, as you mentioned, to think uh, uh, outside the box and you're always at your best. So that we, we've seen in, in our programs that that translates into amazing innovations that sometimes they don't, they don't get the attention that they deserve. So how, how do we find these innovations and, and make them visible, as you mentioned as well? Um, so Iola, I uh, just wanted to ask you if you wanted to respond to this question as well. We have more questions, so you're free to pass from this one if you want. What are the biggest challenges? For me, one of the biggest challenge to increasing diversity is probably education. You know, primarily the education system all over the world has excluded disabled people, especially black and minority ethnic group disabled people from accessing that quality, same level kind of education. And um, I think with, the, with what G GDI is doing uh, across the globe is actually not only scaling out the education, but actually, pro so education and also finances. So if you, do, if you don't have, you know, the quality kind of education that can allow you to be innovative in, in thinking, then it's difficult to break through that barrier. And then funding, especially in African countries where now the GDI hub is actually funding innovative projects where money will have been difficult for most people to access. So for me, that's you know, primarily what I think are the biggest challenges, the lack of um, good equal education at historically and then funding for those who want to be innovative back home in, in Africa or the global south. Thank you. Thank you, Iola. Yes, very, very important. And, and that relates as well to what Paul mentioned about the education and the skills gap and how to foster skills development and, and quality education. But I also wanted to highlight how you mentioned the funding and, and we see that as being quite important in the UK funded 8 to 20 program that we run. And, and we have an example in the, in the accelerator, the assistive technology accelerator that we run in Kenya, where that we sort of uh, help to grow um, businesses that are just starting and need that process of, of being part of an accelerator that can help that business idea to thrive. And, and that's quite important. And it will be good to see more, more funding opportunities for innovators, not only in Africa, but in other regions of the world as well. Um, so I'll move on to the next question, which is how can the disability innovation community best support and learn from social movements such as Black Lives Matter? And I will ask Paul to start with this because you mentioned it during your presentation. So um, what are your opinions on this question? Yeah, thank you. In response to the Black Lives Matter movement, I think it's really important that we learn how to ask them people, that the disabled black people, the people that are, that are there on the forefront, how we can integrate and how we can move forward. Um, because we have to really respect the um, life experience um, and the information from them we need to take and use that on how we can learn from mistakes, how we can look back and uh, take learning from it. So uh, we really need to make sure that there's a bridge now that connects us all. That's so important for our community. We need uh, to value cultures and identities and understandings um, and to do that, we really need to be out there. We need to be visiting. We need to be speaking to people and, and learning and, and taking those experiences. Um, and that's really powerful. And that's really how we can uh, improve and influence the creativity and the innovation from that community. 
I think uh, I think we need to encourage and do a pass over for generations to come without that um, how are we going to improve we need to take responsibility especially um, through leadership um, and give the opportunity back to black innovators it's so important to listen to those lived experiences um, and only then can we really take responsibility and move on to a different way Thank you, Paul. And, and I think what I really liked about your response is that you actually propose a, a way forward and, and how to address the, the, the situation of, of that conversation between um, the disabled community, but also those that are part of, of the of, of Black Lives Matter movement. And um, before going to the, to the next question, I just wanted to open the space for Crystal. To, to respond to this question about how can the disability innovation community best support and learn from social movements such as Black Lives Matter. And I think we will appreciate your response to you being in, in the US and, and knowing what's your perspective on this. I think one of the biggest things that people don't realize about Black Lives Matter movement is that it, a came out of you know serious oppression and tragedy, but that other cultures joined in. I don't think that Black Lives Matter would have been able to garner the traction because this and black people in America have been getting killed you know ever since we got here from slavery. But I think what has happened is that as you began to get you know, white people and, you know, Native Americans and Latinos and then some people from the disability community, again, I say collective impact, coming together and supporting Black Lives Matter, that it became not just a black thing, but a global thing for equity. And so um, I think that what the disability innovation community really needs to understand is how to mobilize um, other groups uh, and become part of a bigger movement. I think that a lot of times we ourselves as people with disabilities um, limit our space. Um, and sometimes because it's just easier or it's what we know or, you know, um, there's the fear of uh, stepping outside of that space. But in order for us to really uh, make movement, to demand respect, um, and to be able to tell our authentic stories, we have to include others. You know, it's just like the women's movement. You know, you have to have men involved because right now men are still the power holders and they have to be supportive in order to help us get through those doors. So, you know, I once saw, I was going to an event, and it was myself, and at that time I could walk, uh, but I had leg braces. And there was another person that had some sort of disability, and they had were carrying some books, and they dropped the stuff. And an able-bodied person said, oh, can I help you? And the person with the disability was like, no, 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 I can handle this myself. Well, you know what? I said, and I say all the time, you know what? If you look at me and I'm struggling, and you ask me, do I need help? I am not going to feel less than. I am not going to have to prove to you that I could do this on my own. And I, I was looking at the lady struggling. I was thinking, damn, you're really stupid. You know, somebody offered you help. And you want to prove that you can do it. I think that we have to be more inclusive. Um, so those are my thoughts. My cut camera. The short of it. Yep, never mind. Thank you, Crystal. And and I really liked how how you mentioned the the importance of of growing the movement and also engaging with other groups and and other social movements. I think that's quite powerful. But also the the 
phrase that you use of, of a global movement for equity and how can different groups push for equity in general as well. Um, I thought that that was quite powerful as well. So I'm aware that we have a few minutes before ending the, the session, five minutes. So I'll just go to the next question. And the next question is, which have been the biggest lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic in relation to disability, race and innovation? And, and Kush, I think this, this question um, will be quite good for you considering what you mentioned before in the session of, of the campaigns that you've been leading. Hi, um, thanks. Um, so one of the things that it's highlighted for me that we have to fight for our human rights, but the truth is that they're very hard won and they're very easily lost. That's something I personally learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we've recently discovered that the more deprived the area, the higher the mo mortality rate from COVID-19. So that was in the Marmot Review that was published recently. In the UK, we've seen that three fifths of all COVID-19 deaths have been disabled people, according to the Office of National Statistic and they equate disabled people to only be 16% of the population. We've found that people with learning disabilities aged 18 to 34 were 30 times more likely to die from COVID-19. And that's a report from Public Health England. We've seen in the health system that 63% of all health workers who died from COVID-19 are BAME from the BAME community, whilst we actually only account for 21% of the NHS, of the, of the workforce, and that's from the British Medical Association. And we've actually seen human rights violations upon disabled people. So the Coronavirus Act and the easements were human rights violations, suspending key, key provisions in the Care Act, the Children's and Family Act. Um, we've seen that there's been do not resuscitate placed on disabled people, people with learning disabilities, with little or no consultation. So I think there's been shocking human rights violations, but it's also shown how powerful the disabled community can be when we work together um, to actually combat um, some of these human rights violations. Um, but yeah, it's one of the things that has also really concerned me is we know that there's been a disproportionate impact upon the BAME community, a disproportionate impact upon disabled people, but there's been no research right now into the intersectional aspect and the compound discrimination of both. And I would love to see more research into intersectionality effects of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Kush. And, and I really, can highlight that that last point that you mentioned of, of the lack of research in, in the intersectionality and, and the COVID-19 uh, impacts. And we've seen that as well in, in other regions, that is something that there's definitely a gap that we need to uh, address uh, from, from the research community. And to close the session, um, I just wanted to do a, a quick summary of, of the amazing um, points that, that you touch on, the importance of visibility, of growing the movement and connecting with other um, social movements as well, but also of, of highlighting the, the power of innovation and how the different uh, identities, social identities in this case, and, and particularly race and disability, but also gender, as, as Crystal mentioned, can be great drivers to show the, the, the value and importance of, of visibility, but also of opening up spaces to discuss and campaigns to change and, and drive forward uh, the impact that we want to see in the next few years. And this is the, the last session of, of the year of our Disability Innovation in Life uh, webinar series. We'll be back in January and we will be sharing information about the next session soon. So. Uh, keep in touch. Do let us know what you thought about this session. You can uh, contact us via email or send us your, your views um, on social media. And we really enjoyed having you today. And we hope you have uh, a good end of the year and uh, an excellent and, and prosperous next year. 
So thank you everyone. And we'll see you back in January. Thank you. Thank you, Navaskar. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Take a picture of the screen. Uh, we'll Very take a much. picture of the screen. <laughs> Say hi, everyone, if you can turn on your cameras and go uh, wave. <laughs> I like your Christmas tree, Crystal. <laughs> I love Christmas. I love Christmas. And it's a real, it's a live tree. Beautiful. So I will finish this session, but again, thank you everyone. Really fascinating discussion and a lot of food for thought for this end of the year and, and uh, amazing things that we could do to move this forward as well. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Quickly. Okay. Before you go, Rosa, can you hear me? Perfect. Um, as you're leaving your um, your screen, there'll be an option to save the closed captioning. Um, and basically, you can just copy and paste um, all the closed captions into a Word document. Um, it's well worth doing it. It helps putting together the transcript.